to invite practitioner Sandra Cooper to the podium. She's my bona fide combolo, as many of you might know. And she brings with you a word that will allow you to examine where you are, who you are, who you are being, and point you, really, to your true innermost self as you are with spirit. Thank you, Ms. Good morning, friends. It always is a pleasure for me to um, bring you the message here this morning, and I welcome each and every single one of you to our beautiful sanctuary, the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living. An equally special welcome to all of those of you joining us on the World Wide Web. Now this morning, I'd like to explore one of those questions that has haunted humanity ever since we became conscious. And there is no one better to introduce the topic than Mullah Nasruddin, notorious as a holy fool from the Sufi tradition. Well, Nasruddin had a bizarre habit of wearing a necklace made out of a ring of pumpkin and came to be known as the man with the pumpkin necklace. One day he went on a journey and at nightfall he fell asleep with a group of other travelers. Shortly before dawn, one man woke early and decided to play a trick on Nasruddin. So he took the pumpkin necklace off of his neck and put it around his own neck. So when Nasruddin woke up, he saw the necklace on the other man's neck. And feeling somewhat confused, he thought to himself, so I know that the man with the pumpkin necklace is Mullah Nasruddin. So who am I? <laughs> So, my message this morning is therefore entitled, Who do you think you are? Here's what some people said in response to the question that I asked. And I quote, I'm a loving wife and mother and uh, a loving wife and mother of four rambunctious sons. Another one said, I am short, overweight, with a wide nose and dark hair. Nothing special to look at. Someone else said, I am someone who feels for others and who has empathy for those in need. And a, a veteran, a war veteran said, I am a retired soldier who has given a leg for her country. And this other one, I'm a recovering alcoholic. And this final one of many others, I am the acting assistant vice president of research and development responsible for new and innovative products. Okay, so all of these responses speak to things such as one's role, appearance, personality, and position. Yet these identity indicators are somewhat transient and they can change with circumstances like divorce, when children leave home, with a loss of a job or with some plastic surgery. And like with Mullah Nasruddin, when his pumpkin necklace was gone, he didn't know who he was because he identified with having that pumpkin necklace around his neck. So just listen to this now, this, this middle-aged woman who had a heart attack. She went into hospital. And while she's being treated, she has what is called a near-death experience, during which she sees God and asks, is this the end? And God says, no, 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 no. You have another 30 or 40 more years left. So elated to hear the news, she decides to stay in the hospital. She recovers. And after her recovery, she decides to have a facelift, liposuction, breast augmentation, and a tummy tuck. And then she calls someone in to change her, to give her a haircut and change her hair color. So after the last operation, she walks out of the hospital and is hit down by an ambulance speeding into the hospital. So she's back in front of God and she says, I thought you said I had another 30 or 40 years. And God replied, oops, sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> 
Friends, while some of us might think we are the image that's looking back at us in the mirror, or the job that we do, or the role that we play, profound insight tells us that there is more to us than physical looks, a title, or being someone's mother. As we take time for deep exploration about who we are, we discover that we are not only a body, a role, or a personality, but something much, much greater with inherent powers, potentialities, and possibilities. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Now imagine that. Being created in God's image means that we embody God's divine attributes. Attributes like love, joy, peace, power, and perfection. Yes, perfection. In spite of any perception of physical flaws or what we may have heard in the past about being worthless sinners, there is perfection and beauty within us. Jesus said so himself in Matthew 5, 48, when he says, be ye therefore perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. End of that scripture. The truth is that God lives here. God lives within me, and that makes me special. God lives within you, and that makes you special. And it makes every single person on this planet equally special. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of the living God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? I remember the first time I heard that. I, it was from this podium when Reverend Elma said, God lives here, and would you keep your house untidy if you knew that God lived here? Okay, so ever since I heard that, I've been working on making sure that my consciousness is clean. Doesn't always succeed, but I work at it. Our true identity, therefore, is our inner self. The spirit of God within us, which can never be taken away. And this is what we must seek to discover and get to know. This is why philosophers like Socrates widely said, wisely said, man, know thyself. As he urged people to seek the answer to the who am I question. So while our body might change in every moment, and trust me, as we get early, er, older, we can notice a lot of dramatic changes, can't we? The inside, what is inside, will never change. The real self never changes. It is all pervading. It is a source of our true identity. And the one constant thing that remains unchanged in the multiple activities of the universe. Yet many of us seem to be oblivious to the real self. As it is often buried beneath a negative self-image, limiting beliefs and experiences. This little story brings it home. A man found a bunch of hardened clay balls in a cave by a beach. Intrigued, he took the bag out of the cave with him. As he strolled along the beach, he would throw the clay balls one at a time out into the ocean, as far as he could. He thought little about it until he dropped one of the balls and it cracked open on a rock. Inside was a beautiful, precious jewel. Excited, the man started breaking open the other 20 or so balls that he had left in the bag. Each contained a similar treasure. Then it struck him. My God, he had been throwing maybe about 50 or 60 of those balls out into the ocean. Inside of them had this wonderful jewel. He had literally thrown away a fortune. Isn't it like that with us? We might look at ourselves or another and see the external clay vessel with its perceived flaws, what I call the bubble wrap legs, and the wrinkles here and the wrinkles there, and colors in the hair that we weren't born with that maybe now only the hairdresser knows for sure, and all kinds of other things. 
And so it may not, the external appearance may not be always beautiful or sparkling or stylish or well known, and so we discount it. But we have not taken the time to find and connect with the inner essence, the true treasure that lies within. That inner essence is immortal. It is the source of all our creative powers, unlimited peace, and unbridled joy. It is a real, inner, invincible, imperishable you. Sadly, we, we lose sight of this powerful, capable, invincible self very, very early in life. I picked up this story on the Temple of Light website yesterday, and I thought I'd share it with you, because I feel it exemplifies the way in which our natural power comes to light when unhindered and when needed. So there are these two little boys who are very good friends, and they live in a little village. And they were very close, even though one was six and the other was 10. Okay, So they went playing one day in a field very, very far away from home. And the older boy fell into a well. His younger friend helped, or, or yelled for help. But no one could hear him because they were so far away from the village. The older boy in the well told him, you have to go and try and find a rope. The younger boy eventually found a rope which he threw into the well. After some time, the friend was able to hold on to the rope and um, the younger boy pulled him out of the well. Back home, they were very excited to tell everyone what had happened. But the adult looks at the, looked at the boys and said, how, how can a six-year-old pull a 10-year-old out of a well? He is so much bigger than you. He's twice your size. Really, tell us. Another one says, you must have had a crane. I'm sure somebody was there to help you. That is not why he succeeded, interjected the wise elder of the village. Now, this wise elder sounded to me like Yoda from Star Wars, you know. But that's another talk. The elder said, the boy succeeded because there was no adult next to him telling him that he can't. So for many of us, gaining clarity about who we really are requires that we peel away many layers of this past conditioning. The installed programming of limited beliefs along with feelings of guilt, shame, and so on, which come up from time to time like they're on speed dial. Something happens, boom, feel guilty, feel ashamed, feel jealous, feel envious, etc. I'm not good enough. I can't, I shouldn't, oh, I don't have, no, I know I'm not, I am too this or I'm too, I'll never be, I'm, you know, that litany of, of limiting thoughts that keep going around in our heads like chichi in a piece of wood. <laughs> well, it is a very familiar sound. And when I'm coaching, I hear these utterances from my clients again and again. And of course, it has made me very super aware of my own because if I am able to recognize them, that it, it means then that I also have these challenges within myself. I'm no exception. The truth is that when you get a real deep down grasp of your divinity, when you get that the Christ presence is expressing perfectly and powerfully in you, in others, in all of nature, throughout creation, you really get what it means to experience oneness. This is how an anonymous person expressed the idea of oneness when asked the question, who are you? And I quote, I am the wind in your hair and the food on your table. I am the moan of a saxophone and the thrill of a flute. I am the simple pleasure of a warm cappuccino in February and a sweet white wine in the summertime. I am the sun on your skin, the salt in your air, and the sand between your toes as you walk along the beach. I am the sweet melody of a favorite song and the joy of opening a gift at Christmas. Isn't that amazing? And that really captures the idea of being one with everything. Who you think you are is probably one of the most important thoughts you can have. 
It doesn't matter what others think about you. What matters is what you think about yourself. You live in a mental universe where it is done unto you as you believe. If you grew up hearing that life was hard, then that is going to be your experience. And it's now time to let go of that belief. If you grew up hearing that you are magnificent and spectacular and could be anything you wanted, then continue to cultivate that belief. Uh, my wonderful assistant this morning, Carol, has just recently had a grandchild. Our little Theo, uh, well, it's about six weeks now, Carol. Oh, she's two months old. And Carol's son is a temple baby. And Carol tells me that whenever she visits this little one, she holds her in her arms and she strokes her and looks into her eyes and tells her that, don't you know you are magnificent? Don't you know that you are special? You are beautiful, you are awesome. And she tells this little baby some wonderful things. I believe that that baby is absorbing these words in her consciousness. I believe that this baby is going to embody these words and grow to be a wonderful, strong, remarkable, and powerful woman. Carol, keep on doing it. And I know that Theo is doing it too. Okay. Now for me, I grew up believing that I was less than. And also, when my father died, I was eight years old and my youngest sister was four months. And there were five of us. So I grew up with the idea that there is not enough. We have to stretch this. Can you, can you be from, um, resonate with that? There is not enough. And so even when I have money, I'm present to holding back as long as I can before I can spend it. And so in that awareness, and also in the awareness now that I am part of a a rich and infinite, abundant universe. I've had to be doing some work, okay? And so I know I've made some headway, but every now and again, one of my old tapes gets triggered and I have to do some maintenance. Affirmative prayer, um, speak with a practitioner, call Macumbala here and work on it. But then the, the challenge is uh, that it comes from a place of awareness. I know when I'm off the path, and I do what I need to do to fix it. So I call myself a work in progress, requiring what a fellow truth student calls conscious spiritual management. I have to firstly be aware of what I'm thinking. I have to be aware of what I'm feeling. I have to be, a, be able to manage the thoughts and the feelings, for example, when I do think of I, I don't have enough, I have to immediately use an affirmation to uh, counter it. And also, I have to be very specific about what I choose. And having been given the gift of choice, something happens, I can choose again. If that doesn't work for me, I can choose again. Recognizing that with every choice, comes consequences, okay? And one of the challenges of, of this work and the old tapes is a tendency that we have to beat upon ourselves. How many of you can relate to that? Oh, I shouldn't be feeling, oh, I shouldn't be doing, I'm a truth student and so on. And we have that kind of chatter. Well, that kind of chatter is also putting us off track of who we really are, okay? So today then could be the day to change those old limiting beliefs. And of course, there are many, many ways to do so. We can choose to see a counselor, a therapist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a coach, okay? Depending, of course, on the, the, you know, your choice, again. Because all of these persons are able to provide support in, that, in the discovery of self, in the fullest expression of, of self. However, change from the inside out happens very, very quickly when we turn to a spiritual practice. Right? God first. In fact, God will, the, the, the presence of God will guide us in terms of what we do, what avenue we should take, and where we should go. 
In the Science of Mind magazine, you know, Carol referred to Eugene Holden's um, messages this month. He reminds us that there is no one else on the planet like you. No one else has the same fingerprints as you, the same DNA as you. No one laughs like you. No one shines like you. You are unique, spectacular, and awesome. Let's say that together. I am unique, spectacular, and awesome. Together. I am unique, spectacular, and awesome. I don't believe that you believe that. Let's say it again. I am unique, spectacular, and awesome. It says, no matter what, be the best you can be. You know, even if you're going to drop, drop gracefully. <laughs> Right? And pick yourself up and smile and move along. That happened to me. I, felt, I was dancing one night and, and this fella dropped me. <laughs> and it's captured on camera. That one didn't get posted on Facebook, Reverend John. But it was all good. And it happened so quick that people didn't notice. And the thing is that it stays, when, when we have a fall, whether it is a, a literal fall or we make a mistake or a slip of the tongue, because it stays in our minds, it then becomes an issue. We, we keep, you know, other people forget, you know. They're not preoccupied thinking about us. They're going about their business and we are going on, and, oh my God, what do I look like? And Jesus, I'm, peace. I'm so clumsy. <laughs> And the voice in the head is going on and on and on. You are here to be your magnificent self, to share your gifts, your talents, your love with the world and like no one else can. No one can do what you can do. Be still and know that you are successful, abundant, healthy and whole. Let's hear that. I am successful, abundant, healthy and whole. Okay, just imagine that my light is just as bright as your light. Your love is as needed as my love. We are all special and no one is better than the other. So how can we deepen our appreciation of who we are? Through our realization of our oneness with God. God first through a heart that expresses a deep and all-inclusive, unconditional love for ourselves and for others. Put up a little post-it on your mirror and remind yourself every time you go to the bathroom to say, I love you, I love you. You are God's perfect expression. I love you. Three, through a disciplined mind that taps the wisdom that goes beyond human knowledge. Because our five senses pick up the, the world. We see, we hear, we smell, we taste, we touch. But there is a, a super sense within that goes beyond what the physical world tells you. And that is where we need to tap into, to tap that wisdom, to have thoughts that rise above pettiness, turning towards the perfection and wholeness that lies within, and which are grounded in that which is kind, loving, and true. Four, through conscious communion with God and an unshakable commitment to spiritual practice, study, and meditation. Five, through commitment to living from the fruits of the spirit in light, love, peace, and joy. Through eyes that see the greatness in yourself and in others in spite of appearances. I remember um, eating a banana, and it was very little speckled and so on, but peeling away the, the, the little black speckled skin, the, the banana itself was sweet and nice. The clay balls break open, and there is a special and precious jewel. Through words and language that are grounded in truth, in other words, being very present to what we say, what we say about ourselves, what we say about others. What are we saying and how are, how are we coming across? Making sure that our words and our language are grounded in truth and that lifts the spirit which honor the greatness in yourself and others. 
This last point about words and language are key. We should not only be present to what we say, but to the thoughts we are thinking. You remember the story of the two wolves? One evening, an elderly Cherokee brave told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle between two wolves is always happening inside of us all. One is dark, it is envy, anger, jealousy, regret, greed, arrogance, guilt, resentment, inferiority, and ego. The other is light. It is joy, peace, love, hope, humility, kindness, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, so which wolf wins? And the grandfather responds, the one that you feed. And what thoughts are you feeding? As soon as you become present to any self-depreciating thoughts, I invite you to put the brakes on it immediately. Jamaican writer Jean Wilson captures this in her beautiful poem, No More Smalling Up of Me. She says, and I quote, no more meekly saying yes when my heart is screaming no. No more taming of my feelings so my power won't show. No more hiding my exuberance from disapproving eyes. No more watering down myself so my spirit won't rise. No more smalling up of me, pretending that I'm not there. No more running from the music and the spotlights glare. No more living in this prison barricaded by my fears. No more turning and retreating in the face of new frontiers. Even as I'm speaking, I'm taking shape and form, harnessing my powers like a gathering storm. There's no obstacle so bold as to dare stand in my way. I'm taking back my life, and I'm doing it today. Thank you, Jean. We need to recognize that we have the power within us and we can tap into it. It's the power of the indwelling God. It's your nature and you can fully embrace your greatness. There is an affirmation in the program that I'd like us to say together. I think it's at the bottom of page four. Let's read it together. I am the beloved of God beautifully made out of love, perfect, whole, and complete. I remind myself of this truth every day as I embrace the fullness of who I am as a spiritual being having a unique human experience. And so it is. Let's say together, I am amazing and remarkable. I'm being the best I can be. I'm amazing and remarkable. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are amazing and remarkable. You are being the best you can be. Reverend John would say, not the whole church, but I would say the whole church. Yes. <laughs> Let us commit today to being who we truly are. No more smalling up of me. You think you can do that? No more smalling up of me. Let's say that together loud. No more smalling up of me. I big up myself. I big up myself. Together, let us cho choose to strip off the disguise of limited thinking and shine as the offspring of spirit. Let's commit to loving ourselves enough not to let anyone or anything keep us from living from that place of beauty, joy, grace, and power. I will close with a meditation. And I'm going to invite you to, as the music plays and as I speak, to just let the words envelop you 
and to know that this is who you are. Within myself is the presence of God, in whose image I am lovingly made, perfect, whole, and complete. I remind myself of this truth this morning as I embrace the fullness of who I am as a spiritual being having a unique human experience. I take time now to get to know this presence. It is closer to me than the very breath that I breathe. It beats my heart. It energizes my body. It provides abundantly for me. No matter what is showing up in my life, I remain poised and peaceful, never weary, never tired, never afraid, never confused. I behold my inner light and I am glad because this is the light of spirit and this is who I am. Who I am is strong, passionate and powerful. Who I am is creative, resourceful, and smart. Who I am is loving, compassionate, amazing, and remarkable. Who I am is the magnificent expression of the living God, created in its perfect pattern. Nothing can change this, and I rise to accept this as the truth about me. How wonderful it is to fully acknowledge my divine nature. I am so grateful for this moment and I am grateful for who I am. And so it is. Namaste. Namaste.